Hello, everyone. This is Outnumbered, live from the DNC. I'm Kaylee McEnany. Here with my co-host, Emily Campagno and Harris Faulkner. Also joining us, Fox News contributor and the Federalist Editor-in-Chief, Molly Hemingway. And Fox News contributor, 32 Advisors founder and CEO and former economic advisor to President Obama, Robert Wolf. Welcome to Outnumbered. Well, we begin here. Thank you. President Biden did not take the DNC stage until just before 11.30 p.m. Eastern time last night. Thanks to a slew of other speakers, Biden's remarks were delayed. Axios reporter Alex Thompson sharing this text from a longtime Biden aide. Quote, this is awful. He literally set up a campaign and handed it over to them. Do they have to cut him out of prime time? Good question. Well, according to Politico, listen to this, convention organizers blamed it on <laughs> ruckus applause interrupting speaker after speaker. Hmm, the RNC managed to manage that applause. But meanwhile, once Biden finally got on the stage, he tried to dispel reports of anger and resentment over his 2024 exit. It's been the honor of my lifetime to serve as your president. I love the job. But I love my country more. I love my country more. And all this talk about how I'm angry at all those people who said I should step down, that's not true. Well, chanting in unison with that was none other than Nancy Pelosi. Despite reports of acrimony, she now loves Joe, too. In fact, just weeks after orchestrating the plot that led to the end of Biden's 50-year career, Pelosi was in the crowd chanting, we love Joe. She loves him, but she has no regrets about the brutal and cold scheme to take him out. How do you talk I to him? Have to do what I have to do. Right. He made the decision for the country. My concern was not about the president, it was about his campaign. As, you, as he has seen the, the exuberance, the excitement that has come forth in our country. No, nobody is questioning the fact that, that the Democratic Party seems much better positioned right now than it did four weeks and two days ago. There's no question about that. Uh, former Speaker Pelosi. So why are we even talking about it? I, they put it on my script and made me, they made me read it. They, you know, she might not want to talk about it, but Nancy Pelosi's finger fingerprints were all over Biden's ouster. You know, Robert, I'm sure you saw the July 10th Morning Joe interview where she said we are waiting for Joe Biden to make a decision, despite the fact that he had made his decision to leave. Jake Sherman said that was like a bomb going off. And then came the headlines, tons and tons of assertions of Nancy Pelosi's role in this. Washington Post, Pelosi told House Democrats Biden may be soon persuaded to exit CNN. Pelosi privately told Biden polls show that he cannot win. And New York Post, Nancy Pelosi forced Biden into a come to Jesus moment about 2024 run with threat to publicly trash him. There is some tension there, Robert, despite the we love Joe hoisting of the sign. So is that to me now? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. OK, well, thanks for having me on. So a lot to unpack there first. I liked that he got on late and uh, went a little longer. I think for all the East Coasters, we wanted to make sure that he could stay up past midnight. So I think they did that as a tease post the debate. Um, <laughs> listen, there was, there was electricity in the air last night. Um, you know, I've been a huge Joe, Joe Biden fan. I was an early supporter for him in 2020. I stayed uh, unwavering uh, throughout and, and until the day he resigned. My, my view was kind of the perfect storm happened, Kaylee. You know, the polls broke, the electoral map widened, um, the donors went to the sideline. And after seeing, you know, whether it was Speaker Pelosi or others kind of, you know, pushing him to kind of make a more pragmatic decision, he made one. And, he, and like he said, he made it. I thought last night was great for him and his family. Um, you know, I, I see it just very differently. I, I think it was his ability to kind of have a goodbye where everyone was just applauding him.
You know, Robert, I do think that's a very honest analysis as to what led to his exit. But Harris, I mean, in contrast to Robert, who just laid out what I think are undeniable facts, I mean, there's a heavy dose of deniability over at MSNBC. Listen to Rachel Maddow. In a truly astonishing once in a lifetime sacrifice that he did not have to make, that no one forced him to make, nor they could anyone force him to make it. A sacrifice of his own ambitions for the good of the country, for the prospects of his party. President Biden instead chose a plan B. Harris. Kelly, there were people on both sides of the aisle who were dragging the man for weeks after June 27th's debate. I mean, give me a break, a, a sacrificial, self-sacrificing uh, moment for him. He saw it. He saw the things that Robert Wolf is talking about. He saw the numbers. And look, if we want to go back to that horrible and deadly withdrawal from Afghanistan, his numbers have not rebounded once. We saw them start to slide, his approval rating. We, start the, we saw that start to slide, and it has never bounced back to what it was. So. He's been watching this in slow motion. And as far as the declining health and, and you know, the, the Justice Department's report that he was a well-meaning elderly man with a poor memory and they couldn't indict him and that sort of thing, put all of that aside, the American public has been seeing what was on full display June 27th at that debate for quite some time. He's feeling it. He's living it. So to say that nobody knew, I, I don't even know if... He should be saying those words. I, I think they're pretty unbelievable. What is believable is after all of that sacrifice through five decades of service as a congressman, a senator, a vice president, now a president, it was still fairly chilly between those two families. And I want to know really behind the scenes if that matters to voters, if their guy at the top that during the primary season they thought they'd voted for is now out from a woman who won't even give an interview to put out her policies in a coherent way. I want to know if that matters to them. We'll have to see. You know, Emily, um, other side of the aisle from Robert is Scott Jennings at CNN. He's a Republican. He had a different view of what went down last night. Let's listen. They're making him give his own eulogy at this uh, convention. I mean, he had to be dragged out by the fingernails. I'm sorry. This is not so he's not here in a happy moment. OK, I know that this, this yarn that's being spun in this hall that he was popular and selfless and handing on. No, no, no. It is the opposite. And everybody knows it. Emily. Yeah, respectfully, I do agree with Scott Jennings analysis of this. And I see this as sort of a, a tale of two paths of two depictions. And on one hand, frankly, we have the highly produced, big theater, super gimmicky DNC convention that is typical. And that is when he comes out and he's pushed out of prime time and they say, thank you, Mr. President, and it's time to move on. And as the headlines say, you know, Biden is passing the torch to Kamala. But interestingly, on MSNBC this morning, the headline read, Hillary Clinton passes the torch to Kamala. And my point about drawing that distinction between there, the production. And then the second one is that of a president who has served this country for 50 years in public office and at this time felt that it was always late. You know, he assumed the presidency late, later than he wanted. He's now being sort of kicked out later than he wanted. This was always not on his own timing that he hoped or expected. So, yes, there was a, a machine that swept him to the side. We see that. It's, it's just like when a family gets a new puppy on board as the old dog is dying, unfortunately. But I think that is true, true, and unrelated from the austerity of the presidential office and the goodbye that he will make to the American people after he finishes being commander in chief. You know, I will say, Molly, um, you know, this convention was heavy on politicians, but light on American people. We heard from three women last night, but it's a contrast to the Republican National Convention where you heard from the brother, Rachel Morin, who mother of five lost to an illegal immigrant. These powerful stories from everyday Americans. Maybe we will hear from them tonight, but I feel like those are the best speeches in either convention. Yeah, it's kind of the difference between showing and telling. So Kamala Harris keeps saying that she's running a campaign for the people, but you're not seeing that evidenced in the convention at all. And, you know, this 
was very sad to see what happened last night. You're thinking, like, they say they're going to take care of people, and they can't even take care of a president who vowed he would not do any events after 8 p.m., and here they push him out of prime time. It was very almost sad to see, regardless of what you think of President Biden. But the problem for Democrats is that the Biden-Harris administration is a failed presidency, and they want people to forget the failure that they're all experiencing over the last few years. And so they think if they can push him out of prime time, people won't remember that this is what the country is dealing with, and with all the failure of the economy, the border, foreign policy, and, else, and otherwise. A lot of policies to answer for. Well, we'll see what night two holds. I did just hear the Freedom Song playing out, so maybe we'll see Kamala Harris again. We'll see. Hey, everyone. I'm Emily Campagno. Catch me and my co-hosts Harris Faulkner and Kaylee McEnany on Outnumbered every weekday at 12 p.m. Eastern, or set your DVR. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the Fox News YouTube page for daily highlights.